Hey, can I please have some of your time? I have to tell a long story because this is just fascinating. Ladies and gentlemen, you are currently looking at a fascinating silk moth. The scientific name is Samia ricini, the Erie silk moth. It's a species that is farmed commercially for the production of silk. It's one of the most popular moths in captivity in the world and breeding them is a multi-million dollar industry. Have you ever worn clothing or items made out of silk? Then there is a chance that they were made of the silk of these very insects. So these deserve some special attention, don't you agree? Today I'm going to tell you all about the Eri silk moth, a highly fascinating insect that everybody should breed. This is going to be a long educational video, but also an essential one if you have any interest in moths or insects or the family Saturnidae. As one of the most important commercial insects and silk moth species, it's time for you to watch and learn all about them today. Welcome to one of my longest and most awaited videos that has been in production for over a year. Samia Ricini Moth Cycles. Oh. My. God. Oh my God. Guys. Look at what I am holding here. These are actual silkworms, aka the caterpillars of a species of moth that is actually massively farmed around the world for the production of commercial grade high quality silk. This is Samia Rizzini, the tree of heaven silk moth. And the tree of heaven silk moth is one of the few truly domesticated insects. This species does not even live in the wild. Much like a domesticated cow or a domesticated chicken or a pet dog or a cat, breeding them in captivity has led to selection that diverged these animals and made them quite different from their wild counterparts. These animals are bred in captivity and because of artificial selection produce high quality grade silk. Do you want to be a moth farmer like me on YouTube? Then this species is also an excellent species for beginners. If you want to start breeding moths and you don't know what species to start with, Samia Rizzini, the tree of heaven silk moth is your best shot because this is one of the best species for beginners. They are super easy to breed and they produce high quality silk that you can actually use to craft objects. Have you ever wanted to produce your own silk at home that you can use to make items like clothing? Then look no further than these awesome silkworms. But how can we breed them? How do we breed these beauties in captivity? Ah, well, Luckily, your sexy moth king is here today to explain to you how to breed Samia Rizzini in this new and fresh episode of Moth Cycles. My web series in which I show the life cycle of certain species from egg to adult moth. Welcome to Moth Cycles, Samia Rizzini. Let's start the intro. tips. If you want to breed moths, it's important to know the life cycle begins with eggs. The eggs of Samia ricini are oval and white. A single female may lay hundreds of eggs. The eggs are then typically incubated around room temperature, which is around 20 degrees Celsius. 
warmer is also acceptable. After about two weeks, the babies come out. The container used for incubation can be anything. They prefer small closed plastic containers. Petri dishes and cricket boxes work pretty well as well. Spraying them with water is also an option and it helps in moderation. But make sure not to drown the eggs. The babies feed on vegetation such as leaves from cherry, privet, tree of heaven, sweet gum, castor plant and more. And now we can finally get started. These are the group of caterpillars I'm going to be raising today. Bloodline A, Samia Rizzini Blue Feet. Now this is a little bit bold of me, but what I have done is I placed a petri dish with baby caterpillars in a bigger plastic box with twigs of privet leaf, which they do seem to appreciate. What's interesting is that Samia caterpillars are social when they are young and will live together in groups. The trick to keep the babies healthy is to keep their container clean. Remove poop and give them fresh new leaves every few days. If they are happy, they will actively roam the vegetation and have a big appetite. The second instar is somewhat yellow with black dots. They can go from the first to second instar in just about a week. In this stage they are still social. In the first two stages, it's okay to keep them in bigger groups. I did have one problem. They were in a sort of small container at this point. One which they were completely outgrowing. They were growing well in this container for now, but they would desperately need an upgrade. <clears throat> so what I did is I took the caterpillars, grabbed them and put them inside a bigger cage. In this cage here they have a lot of space per individual and aren't packed tightly together. And then they shifted to Insta number 3. In Insta number 3 the insects become pale white with a black head capsule. In this stage they are still somewhat social and their appetite is even bigger, like you wouldn't believe. However, I did have a problem. At this stage the larvae were kind of growing too big for their small cage again. They were starting to eat all the food faster than I could replace it. So I decided to move them from their small cage to a bigger one. I put them in the bigger cage. I switched the food from privet to sweet gum because sweet gum has bigger leaf. Before you know, most of them were already in, in star number 4. In star 4 is also white but can be identified because their head at this point turns yellow instead of black. Additionally, in this life stage the animals become rather solitary and don't like to hang out in big groups anymore. The speed at which they start eating is also incredible. They would defoliate entire tree branches in mere days. They are also coated in white powder that makes them water resistant and may also prevent them from harm and maybe even pathogens. It kind of feels like talcum powder. Now Samia ricini is an easy species recommended for beginners, amateurs and newbies. That doesn't mean experienced breeders have no reason to breed them however. You see, with selective breeding it's possible to make your own unique strains of them in captivity, selected by size and color. Experienced breeders can do miracles with these pieces. Bloodlines with unusual colors also sell for higher prices. Despite being a beginner species, it is possible to fail with them if you keep them overcrowded or in poor ventilation. This species prefers more dry, ventilated air in my opinion. In closed plastic containers, without breathing holes or ventilation, they could die, especially if many larvae are tightly packed together. Keep them in cages or open boxes with the lid removed, covered with netting so they cannot escape. Breeding them is also profitable if you are good at it. This species is very common, so eggs and cocoons are kind of cheap, but if you are talented, it's easy to produce them in massive numbers which you can sell by the thousands if you want and you can start your own silk farming business. Interesting to note is that this species is fully domesticated. Much like cows, sheep, chickens, house cats and dogs, they cannot survive in the wild for long. They were selectively bred for the production of silk and they are 100% dependent on human care. 
Their domestication and wild ancestors originate from India, however, where silk farming is an ancient practice. Bloodline A, Samia Rizzini Blue Feet, was growing well and I was happy with the results. I did start to notice some of them were shedding their skins to the final instar. Look guys, as you can see, they're growing very well, aren't they? Of course they are, I'm the sexy moth king, of course they're growing well. Also helps that this is a beginner species, but hey, you know what, let's not ruin the illusion. Ooh, look at that, real beauties, aren't they? What's up there, guys? I farmed a good collection of hungry little pigs, haven't I? Yeah. Look at that. The Hitsini are growing very well, and this is not even all of them. Here in the cage you can see many more. Can you see it? Wow, here it is. The final instar. The final instar of this piece is white and pale, but sometimes they can have unusual colors, sometimes even black spots. It depends on the origin of the bloodline. Sometimes they have been hybridized to make them bigger or give them more color. I noticed that some of my caterpillars did have a blue or yellowish sheen to them. Maybe they had some genes from wild Samia in their bloodline. This is very common and the animals are often hybridized with wild Samia moths to prevent inbreeding. Sometimes talented breeders can design their own hybrids with special traits or colors. Bloodline A, Samia Rizzini Blue Feet indeed had pretty blue prolegs. Can you see it? It's quite pretty in my opinion. There is a chance that there are some genes in here from species like Samia Cynthia, another wild Samia species. Not surprising considering most of them have been hybridized sometime in the past and they were also starting to get pretty big. At this point they were also about one and a half month old. From egg to pupae usually takes about six weeks. That means they should be making cocoons soon. There you go, look at that, a larva spinning a silk cocoon for me. How exciting! Ladies and gentlemen, good news, we have cocoons, tada! Look at that, look at the beautiful marvelous white silk, it's incredible. Let's take some scissors to cut this off. Notice how sometimes they love to fold their cocoons inside a leaf. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever seen cocoons like this on my YouTube channel before? The answer is no. This is top quality silk. See that? The whiteness, the softness, it feels very soft. Now I have many videos of life cycles of moths on my YouTube channel. And many of them make big and beautiful cocoons, but most of them are brown or greenish. But not white and soft like cotton wool. Most cocoons are rough and hard and strong to protect them from the elements. But this creature, as I said, is a commercial insect for the production of silk. And this is top quality silk. You could use this to make clothing. Ooh, look at all these fresh cocoons. Now these cocoons, they are still transparent. You can see the caterpillar in them. So I'm not going to harvest those, it's too early. Let's let them finish the development first. But here in the back I see some finished cocoons that are mature. Let's cut them off. Oh, this is great. Ah, I love a successful rearing project. Makes me happy. Now, of course, this is a total beginner species, so uh, I don't feel as accomplished as I normally do when uh, I, I see cocoons, but I still feel happy. You know that happiness when you see the first cocoons, it never goes away, even if they're easy to breed. Look at this guys, look at this. Let me take the leaves off for a second, just uh, to show you its beauty. I don't want to have these leaves on them anyways, because they might start to rot takes the moss a good month or so to hatch from the cocoons, usually on room temperature. 
and uh, see if we can take some of the leaf litter off that they uh, so cleverly hit themselves in. It's easy to do because the silk is strong. We don't. There's no risk of us destroying the cocoon. These cocoons are strong. Oh yes, there you go. Now, this is the first harvest, guys. Let's see how many we have. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven fresh white top quality cocoons. Ah, look at that. This is great. This is just great. I'm happy. Uh, many caterpillars still have to follow. I don't know how much we'll have in total, but um, with some luck there's going to be like 20, maybe 30 cocoons. I haven't even counted. So uh, super silky smooth. It feels really good in my hand. Wow. I should design my own clothing brand. Bart Coppen Silk. More and more start spinning cocoons. I had successfully raised some Erie silk moths without major losses. How awesome! Let's keep harvesting. Today we have a good harvest with many new cocoons and here on the right are the last caterpillars, there's actually many left and this is some of their last food so I guess I have to give them some new food pretty soon. These caterpillars are very good at running out of food, I guess that makes them communist. Oh wait, maybe this channel should stay politically neutral because I don't want to insult my communist moth breeder fans. I don't know if the, that exists, but hey, you know what? Anything is possible on the internet today. And now before you ask, I am not alt-right, okay? Making fun of communism doesn't mean I'm automatically right-wing, okay? People of the internet, there is more than just a uh, division between right-wing and left-wing. You should try to think out of the box a little bit more. Anyways, um, we have many new cocoons today. Ta -ta -ra -ta -ta. There's uh, some leaf material between them, I should take that out. There you go. I'll fix that later. But as you can see, the, the brood of Ritzini are doing really well. I haven't counted how many these are yet. We'll, I take them back inside and that's where we will count them. Right now I'm just concerned about these uh, caterpillars. As you can see, there is uh, still a, a truckload of uh, caterpillars. How many are in here? Here's uh, the bottle with their food plant and this is not enough. I think I need to include some more food for them pretty soon. Oops, maybe to ma today or tomorrow? No, or tonight actually, because this is not going to last them longer than a few hours maybe. So, uh, but yes, our adorable gummy worms are growing well. And it makes sense because I did a lot of effort. I gave them love, I gave them passion. I tried to be the best moth daddy I, um, that's possible for them. And my hard work paid off. We are producing some quality cocoons. I'm happy. Ladies and gentlemen, so did we do a good job today? Of course we did. I'm the sexy moth king, how could I not do a good job? Okay, that's a joke. There's many species that I still can't breed to today. So don't think I'm that arrogant. I'm not even that good of a breeder. It's just my online persona. Let's get some of the sticks and mud out of here. Yeah, this is what we raised. It's a lot of fine quality silk cocoons, isn't it? Look at that. Top quality, I tell you. So, um, I haven't counted them yet, but let's do an estimation because I don't want to count all of them. I'd say this is about 40 cocoons. Hey, it could be 30, it could be 50, I could be off by 10. But uh, let's say this is about 40 cocoons. Good result. 
Now what you have to do is you put these cocoons on room temperature and then you are expected to have moths in about three to four weeks time. People often say that the Sami Aritzini is a, a noob species. I disagree and I agree. I agree that it's a noob species because they are super easy to raise for everybody. It's an absolute beginner species. But that doesn't mean that they are only interesting for a beginner. If you are an experienced breeder, there's many cool things you can do with them. You can create new strains. You can do uh, artificial selection and create hybrids, you know. Create your own unique variants of the Sami Aritzini. It's actually possible to do so if you're good at breeding them, especially for multiple generations. See, this is good stuff. Let's wait for the moths to hatch. So, you have managed to produce a lot of Sami Aricini cocoons. What's next? I'm going to show you. First you need a cage, preferably an insect puppet cage. It's easy to buy these online. This will form a good enclosure for your cocoons. Secondly, you need a towel. They prefer to lay down on a soft substrate that absorbs moisture. A towel is perfect for this. I usually put a towel on the bottom of the container. The next thing you do is you put the cocoons in. Like this. Make sure they are on top of the towel. Next thing you do is spraying water. How often should you spray your cocoons? Well, they don't want to be constantly wet, okay? They just want to be moisturized. Who doesn't like to be moisturized? Shall I moisturize you? It's a good idea to do this every two to three days time. This prevents them from drying out in captivity. Next, you close the cage and then the game, waiting game begins. Expect to see your Samia hatch in about one to two months time, depending on the temperature. The warmer it is, the faster they will emerge. And now the waiting game begins. This took about one month and then the moths came out. But thanks to YouTube magic, this month only lasts a few seconds. Yay! Let's skip to the moment the moths came out. What's up, Samia gang? West side. Yeah, that's right. Look at these beauties here. This is what hatched uh, last night. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine moths so far. And as you can see, some of them have, are already pairing. Just take a look here. These are pairing. Can you see they're attached? Technically, I should not disturb them, but I don't care. This is Samia Rizzini, very easy to breed. I'll get pairings anyway. See? If they are attached together like this, it means that they are in the process of uh, making babies to make it family friendly. See? Pretty cool. Pretty cool. And I raised a whole lot of cocoons. I forgot how many it was. I think it was like 50. So with a bit of luck, we're going to have a lot of moths over the next few days. And with that a lot of eggs, yeah. Now these eggs are a bit too much for me to breed. So I think I'm going to sell some online. In some cases, um, so a lot of people ask me why I still rarely sell animals online. 
That's because usually I do not like trading. I do not like shipping animals. It's not an ethical issue. It's just that I really hate the process of shipping itself, making all these letters, sending people emails, processing their orders. It sucks. It's work that I hate doing. So I avoid it as much as I can. I'm sorry for that if you are hoping to buy a rare species from me online. It's probably not going to happen. But today I have too many, too many eggs of moths. Because they have two pairings and I'm not going to raise even more Samia. And uh, probably going to have more pairings on top of that tomorrow or the day after tomorrow. So, yeah. You can bet that I have to sell these eggs to some friends or something at least. But uh, the re rearing project was uh, pretty good so far, isn't it? Most are here in good condition. Some uh, here have imperfections, but uh, that's because of, uh, well, they're Samia Ritsini. They have like these weird birth defects sometimes. Overall, pretty successful. If any of you were thinking about breeding this species, I hope this video will help you in the future. So, pretty cool species though. Samia Rizzini gets a lot of hate online. People call it a beginner species, a newbie species. Uh, I think it's a good species to do experiments with. They're easy to breed. There's no shame in enjoying something that's easy to breed, to be honest. Not everything in life has to be overly complicated and has to be all about your ego. Sometimes it's okay to enjoy things that are easy. Sometimes it's okay to enjoy things that are widespread and accessible. You know, we don't need no elitism in this channel. So there you go. Let's uh, check back tomorrow. The amount of moths will probably have doubled, at least I, I suspect. There they are. Our first eerie sub moths from Bloodline A, Blue Feet. They seemed of average size, but pretty healthy overall. The wings weren't terribly crippled, which is the case with some inbred bloodlines of Samia Rizzini, unfortunately. Most of them were pretty symmetrical. So, now you know the basics of how I raised them. I expect you, my precious dear viewers, to follow my example and breed some of them yourself too. This is an amazing species to study various bloodlines of. And today I can offer you a very nice live example of the effects of domestication on the Samia silk moths. Here on the right, with the white cocoons, we have the domesticated Samia Rizzini. Here on the left, we have an actual wild Samia that was taken from the wild for me, from the Philippines. These cocoons were collected locally in the Philippines and taken from the trees and exported to the Netherlands. So they are actually wild animals. These cocoons I raised myself in captivity. They are the cocoons of the Samia Rizzini, the domesticated Eri silk moth, Tree of Heaven silk moth, whatever you call them. Can you see the difference? Here we have a female of the wild Samia Lutsonica. And this is what an actual wild species of Samia looks like. It would be incorrect to say that these are the ancestors of the Samia Rizzini. Because the exact ancestor of Samia Rizzini doesn't exist. You see, Samia Rizzini is a polyhybrid, as I probably have mentioned before. That means that it is a hybrid consisting of the genes of several different species. How does that work? Well, everywhere in Asia, in the wild, there are wild Samia species. And there's quite a lot of them. I don't know how many from top of my head, but I think there's like 20 or maybe even 30 different species of Samia in the wild. And traditionally, the Samia Rizzini, which is this domestic animal here, the Samia Rizzini has traditionally been bred 
in Asia also for the production of silk. But what is interesting is that this animal, the Samia Ratsini, is bred for silk in India, it's bred for silk in Indonesia, it's bred for silk in Vietnam, it is bred for silk in Thailand. And everywhere in these countries, people are crossing the domesticated animal with the wild animals that they can find. But it turns out that the wild animals that are found in the wild are wildly different per country. For example, in the Philippines you will find radically different species of Samia than you will in Vietnam or Thailand. And that makes sense because every country has different species. For example, this is the Samia Lutsonica from the Philippines. But in other parts of Asia, the wild Samia will be Samia Cynthia, Samia Kaninghi. There's many species of them. So that's quite interesting. And because livestock of the Rizzini gets exchanged worldwide and also gets traded per country and eventually these genes, they end up being mixed up internationally, including the genes of many wild Samia species. Now, some people would also say that the size of the domestic version is smaller than the wild ones. Uh, in many cases this is true, although this is not a good example because Samia Lutsonica is a very big Samia species. I think this is one of the bigger species of Samia that exist. So compared to the Ricini of course it's going to make Ricini look small. It's a beauty. Also interesting to note is the um, white abdomen. As you can see, Rizzini has a white abdomen, but there is no species of wild Samia that have wild, uh, white abdomens. The loss of color in the abdomen is usually a sign of domestication. So if you have a Samia and you see the abdomen is white, like this one, then you can be sure that there are at least some genes in there of the Samia Rizzini. See now can you now you can see the white abdomen better. Can you see it? It has a white ass, a white butt. And that is typical for the domesticated insect. Now of course the biggest difference whoop, the biggest difference can be seen in the cocoons themselves. Let's remove both of them from the scene. Thank you guys for participating. The cocoons, of course, are the biggest difference here. As you can see, these cocoons are soft and white. And this is because Samia Rizzini has been artificially selected for the best quality silk for a few hundred years. So, in captivity, the silk they produce is quite unnatural, but their silk is high quality for humans. And this is commercial silk used to produce clothing items, blankets, I don't know, shawls, whatever you want to make out of silk. Now here we have the wild Samia cocoons of the Lutsonica and as you can see the wild cocoons they are brown, but they are also very tough. If I have to squeeze them my fingers actually have to do some effort to press them down. And that's because the silk, of course, is protection for the wild animal. The silk is also what camouflages them. Some birds and rodents, they can uh, pack open the cocoon or uh, like rats, mice, can use their sharp teeth to chew the cocoon open sometimes and eat the pupa that's inside. There uh, is predation, actually. This one is empty, I can press it. And because of that they have to be tough, they have to be camouflaged. So this silk is it's really tough, it feels kind of like leather. But this is just super soft and uh, silky smooth. 
But the expression silky smooth is wrong because silk is actually not smooth. Silk is tough. It is the domesticated animal that has the smooth silk. So that's funny. Here you can see wild cocoon, domesticated Samia Rizzini. Quite cool to see the difference, don't you think? And this is evolution in progress. It's artificial selection. But it shows in just a few hundred years of artificial selection how traits like these can radically change in these insects. Um, it is very much the same as the domesticated cow that produces tons of milk. They never would in the wild. And that have also weird coloration, like these spots. Or the domesticated chicken that grows naturally fast or produces an egg or two every day. That doesn't happen with the wild uh, ancestors of chickens. Or maybe like sheep who have a thick coat of wool. In the wild I believe, wild sheep and goats actually they shed their wool every spring uh, because it would be too warm for them. So domesticated sheep they don't shed their wool, they have a thick wool coat all year, but if you look at the wild sheep, the wild goats, most of them in spring, they just, they just shed all their wool, it just drops literally off their body. And uh, otherwise they would suffer a lot in summer, you can imagine. And that's just one example of how we humans have completely changed the traits of certain animals over the course of history. It's fascinating. It's quite fascinating that we have managed to do it with insects of all things. So there's actually, there's not many moths or insects in general who are domesticated. Samia Ricini is one of the only exceptions. Of course, also with the uh, Bombix mori, the mulberry silk uh, moth, or also known as the silk worm. Probably uh, the, most, the most popular type of silk moth. I should do an episode about Bombix Mori another day. But yeah, it's pretty cool. It's also funny to see how this wild Samia is pretty stressed out because I'm handling her. As you can see, she's trying to escape. And the domesticated insect is just chilling there. He doesn't care. He doesn't give a fuck. Yeah. So. Wild versus domestic. Anyone? This is not even my final form. This, ladies and gentlemen, is how you do Sami Arisini as a professional. Take a look at that. This is not even half the moths I have. Half the cocoons are still about to hatch. So, ta-da! Look at this amazing result. Awesome, isn't it? Really awesome. And in my opinion, Samia Rizzini are really pretty insects. With these moon-shaped markings on their wings. Really great. Wow, take a look at that. It's really super amazing. Now I do have to address something, since we have the opportunity to. Cheers. When I was making this episode, I was telling people that I'm going to make a Samia Rizzini moth cycles. And I got a very mixed response. Some people were enthusiastic, but I also got a negative response I wasn't, uh, um, I wasn't expecting. One of the reactions I got was people saying, Bart, why are you making this video about Samia Rizzini? Samia Rizzini is a newbie species and is below your level. Yeah, that pisses me off a little bit. If there is something that I am really strongly against in this hobby, it is elitism. I've said it in multiple videos, but if you are breeding moths, just to prove that you are good at breeding them, you should get out of this hobby. 
These are animals, not Pokemon, okay? They are not status symbols. And it's true that Sami Ericini is easy to breed. It is a good species for beginners, it's a beginner species. But people acting like certain types of animals are below them is the most ridiculous concept I've ever heard. And if I hear it, I am probably a little bit angry with you, because that's one of my pet peeves. I cannot stand elitism in this hobby. On this channel I complain a lot about things like tarantula channels, because they are just promoting consumerism, promoting these animals as products to buy. Oh, you have to own the rarest. Oh, you have to own the most expensive species. Bullshit. You don't have to. If you are only in this to own the most rare and expensive animals, then you are pathetic and I don't look up to you for sure. I study these animals because I am genuinely fascinated in their biology. And biology doesn't discriminate between common or rare, cheap or expensive. Those concepts don't even exist in biology. So it's pretty... Yeah. It's pretty damn, you know, entitled. If you think these animals just exist for the purpose of validating your existence, that's just so stupid. And Sami Aracini is a great species, you know. If you think about it, this is one of the most important silk moths for humans. Because um, in many third world countries, people farm these animals and uh, sell the silk cocoons to make money. These uh, animals probably sustain thousands of people's of lives, you know? They give people income. I know in some countries like Indonesia, Thailand, also other countries, maybe Vietnam, there are many uh, eerie silk moth farms where actually uh, whole families work day to day to breed these animals for silk and are provided with a little bit of income. These animals are domesticated, they are production animals, much like the cows that produce our milk, much like the chickens that produce the eggs that we eat, much like the sheep that provide the wool for our sweaters. These Sami Aricini are domesticated for the sole purpose of silk production and are therefore commercially important species. They are not here to stroke your ego or to say that you are better than a beginner who likes to breed moths. If you are in this for clout, I don't understand. There is no clout in breeding moths. Yeah, there's me and my channel and me and my small 20,000 subscribers are the biggest moth channel on YouTube. That's not clout, dude. That's not clout. And the reason I have so many subscribers is not because I act like a dick and brag about how rare my species are, it's because I have genuine passion and because I'm good at explaining stuff about them on YouTube and people like to tune in and listen to me and see me work with these animals. And I am not above any species. Yeah, I, am, I have more experience than the average breeder. I'm not the best, but I'm not ever going down that path of elitism. And it, uh, making this video scared me a little bit. Because I got a lot of those comments, you know, but like Bart, wow, why is, why is Bart Coppens breeding Sami Ericini? It's so pointless. It's not pointless, dude. It's a moth. I like moths. There's really nothing more, no more, no other complicated factors involved. They are nice moths and I like moths. I don't need to justify. It seems that you need to justify breeding these nowadays. If you are into arts and crafts, then uh, it's pretty great because you can use the silk to make your own cool stuff with. Ta-da! Amazing. Pairing these species is very straightforward. They are not picky about temperature or lighting at all. They will pair during the day and during the night, although they have a preference for being active in darker conditions. Unfortunately, Sami and Ritsini are often deformed by inbreeding. 
I did have a few species in my bloodline that were misshapen. This can be prevented by crossing them with wild Samia species, which rejuvenates their bloodlines with fresh genes from the wild. In most bloodlines of Samia there is always a minor amount of freaks with unusual wings. I guess this is a side effect of domestication. Ladies and gentlemen, now this is an excellent result, don't you think? Look at all those moths, wow! And I raised them all myself, that makes it even better. You know, if I buy cocoons online, it's never uh, that satisfying than raising them yourself from egg to moth. Wow! It truly is amazing to see so many of these awesome Samia. Samia ricini is a species I really recommend for every breeder, for beginners and for experienced breeders. They can be fun. You can do your own experiments with them, create your own bloodline, mix them, hybridize them, create the shapes and colors you want. It's very easy to control their traits like that. The species is easy to breed, so I raised maybe a little bit too many of them. Because uh, I am a more experienced breeder. And when I obtain an easy to breed species, sometimes it results in too many moths. But hey, is there really such a thing as too many moths? I don't think that it can exist. Now, Samia ricini is an amazing species in many regards, but like most silk moths, they don't live very long. They have no functional mouth and starve after 7 to 40 days time, usually. They just live long enough to find a partner, mate, lay eggs and die. It's funny that I as a YouTuber often spend months and months of energy raising creatures that barely live for a week. Yep, that's true. Over the months, the moths get fairly broken, worn down and eventually die. It's sad that their time has already come to an end. Beauty is a fragile thing and they only live for about a week. It has something poetic as well in my opinion, but the gift of life was passed on in the form of eggs. And they're dead. Most of them are starting to die, as you can see. This is mostly dead material. Some of them are still a little bit alive, as you can see, and moving. But uh, this is the downside of breeding moths. They are not very short-lived pets. Uh, the Sami Ericini, they uh, usually they uh, live a good day or 10, maybe uh, 14 if you're lucky. And they have no functional mouth parts. These moths, they cannot eat. They are literally unable to feed. And therefore, after a week or two, they basically run out of energy and starve. And these moths right here, they are on their last legs. As you can see, some of them are still moving and shaking. Some of them are still in good condition. But most of them are starting to die right now. This one, for example, is long dead. See it? And this one is pretty dead. A lot of people ask me, what do I do with my moths when they die? Well, I throw them away because they die in this condition, okay? If you let their moths live a natural life, they don't, don't become preserved very well, to be honest. Not fit for collection purposes, at least. So collectors would not be happy with these moths. The perfect ones you see for sale in shops are actually being killed for collection. If the wings are in perfect condition, it was most likely killed. If you let them live a normal, natural life, the wings will damage. So uh, these moths are dying and soon I'm going to have none left. But they did leave a gift, which is many eggs, of course, for the next generation. I already had a lot of moths and now I will have even more moths. Females of this species lay between 50 to 300 eggs depending on the size and health of the female. So imagine how many Samia Ricini blue feet babies I'm going to have. And guess what happened two weeks later? Yeah, 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 babies. Excellent, awesome and splendid. Life cycle complete, ladies and gentlemen.
Thank you for watching. Just kidding, we aren't finished yet. You see, this isn't a normal episode of Moth Cycles. This is a special crowdfunded Patreon episode. That means I'm going to do some extra effort here. You see, I promised to make this video when we hit the goal of $318 per month on my Patreon as a reward. And ever since that happened, this video has been in production. As a reward, my way of saying thank you to my fans. And I noticed something. A new strain of Samia on the market. They are named Samia Rizzini Zebra. And supposedly the caterpillars have black dots and stripes, like a zebra. So I decided to breed them for you as well. Yep, here are the eggs, ladies and gentlemen. The eggs of our second bloodline of moths. Bloodline B, Samia Rizzini Zebra. I wonder if this will be that different as was promised. The babies looked normal at first. Although I do guess they had more dots than usual. The first few instars grew easily, once again without much losses. And after a while the babies did develop stripes. Can you see it? Three, they are like small zebras. How curious. I'm not going to explain the basics again, since we've already done a life cycle. Slowly and slowly they grew bigger and bigger and I did decide to give them a mix of privet, but also sweet gum again, which was in season. Bloodline B, Samia Rizzini Zebra, was growing quite well. And one thing I noted, however, was that their growth was a little bit disharmonious. Some larvae were still small, while others were gaining size. This is not uncommon for Samia Rizzini in general. The smaller ones are usually weaker individuals. So how are these Samia Rizzini Zebra created? As usual, it's most likely a combination of hybridization with other Samia species and selective breeding. Their colors are more enjoyable than regular Samia Rizzini that I suppose. Every bloodline of Samia Rizzini is a slightly bit different, both as larvae and adults. And this is what I want to show you in this episode. Not just one life cycle, but also some of the unusual and unusual variations. My idea is, is, uh, that is, if other breeders of silk moths see this video, they will be inspired to make their own selective breeding projects and cre create their own bloodlines that stand out from the rest. I think if some experienced breeders find the motivation to do this, we can do some cool new forms in the future. You see, due to inbreeding, it's hard to find good quality bloodlines of Samia Ricini nowadays. A lot of greedy breeders will keep inbreeding them until they are crippled and weak just to sell them to others. It would be great if some breeders could improve these weak bloodlines. Thankfully, bloodline B, Samia Rizzini Zebra, was growing well and seemed healthy. And now we have the cocoons, it was time to wait once again. Four to six weeks is enough. And then we can finally see some moths. Yes, this, uh, this Samia Rizzini Zebra, they are way prettier than normal Rizzini. I've decided. If all the specimens look like this, it's gonna be a good rearing. Look at that. This is Rizzini Zebra, the male. Look at the beautiful white it has. Hmm, I like that. You don't see that that often in normal Rizzini. Wow, there it is! The first Samia Ricini Bloodline B Zebra Moths. It's pretty cool to see that these individuals are somewhat different. Some of them had a very thick white bands on their wings. Now this is quite beautiful in my opinion. Proof that yes, different bloodlines do produce different looking moths. Let me know in the comments, which Samia do you prefer, the first one or the Zebras? Before you know, the Zebras were making love. This would result, of course, in many eggs. Life cycle completed once again. I am on a roll here. I wasn't kidding when I said I'm going to teach you everything there is to know about Samia Rizzini. Well, there you go, lads. Feast your eyes upon what is called the Samia Rizzini Zebra strain. They don't look that different from other Rizzini to me, but they do look different. Not very different, but different after all. 
I had many more. As you can see, some of them are already dead. Like I said many times, these moths don't live very long. Uh, I already had a pairing. So uh, the male and female who originally paired are already dead. And these are all single girls. Turns out I had one male and like seven females so far. But that's okay, I have so many Sami Aritzini right now. It's okay if I don't have that many pairings. Oof, the wind is blowing it away. See, uh, they already produced eggs. And most of these eggs are fertilized because the male, when he was alive, paired with the female several times. So I think half of these are like fertile. It's going to uh, be another giant baby boom. But yes, let's take another good look at the Rizzini zebra for whatever that name is worth. Just the hybrid Samia. But in the end, all Samia Rizzini are some type of hybrid, if you think about it. So yeah. There you go. Rizzini zebra, do you like them? It's like, uh, for this video I want to show you many strains. Uh, because of the blowing wind, their uh, wings are going all the way, so it's hard to see their original shape, I guess. Wait, I think... Oh no, they're... Is there not really a male in here somewhere? I think, is this dude a male? No, he isn't. No, that's a female. Nope, they're all females then. And they're trying to walk away from the wind, I guess. Unfortunately, not all bloodlines of Sami Aricini are that nice. Some of them are horribly deformed due to inbreeding. If you want to breed this species, it's important to get a strong and healthy bloodline from a competent breeder. Recessive traits due to inbreeding make the animals weaker and smaller. During the production of this video, unfortunately, I obtained such a bloodline. What you're about to see could be a little bit shocking or disturbing. This is unfortunately what Sami Aricini looks like after inbreeding for several generations. They become increasingly deformed and misshapen. The reason people inbreed them is because they are mass produced for silk, even as food for reptiles. Therefore people don't really care that much about the health or the appearance of the animals themselves and just prefer to breed high numbers of them. It's pretty unfortunate because this could be prevented by combining multiple bloodlines instead of crossing brothers with sisters. During the production of this video, unfortunately, this happened to me. Somebody who promised to sell me healthy eggs of these moths actually gave me eggs of moths that were horribly inbred and weak. And while that's a little disturbing, it also resulted in something interesting. They produced some of the smallest and weirdest Sami Aricinis that I have ever seen in my life. They were about half the size of a normal Samia and their wings were weird square and diamond shape. Very, very strange mutants. You're about to see the story unfold. The story of Bloodline C. Samia Rizzini Mini. The story, of course, begins like all the other stories. With babies and a whole lot of them. The babies actually look quite normal. There was no indication that they were unhealthy. At first, they fed and grew pretty well. In a container with privet and cherry leaves as usual. Nothing out of the ordinary. Then I placed them in a bigger faunarium as they started to defoliate all the other leaves. This, 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 blah, sorry. this did not last very long, because after a short time they started eating all the leaves before I could replace them. That's why soon after they were in a big cage with cherry and privet. Interestingly they actually had a rather high survival rate. Rearing them was mostly problem free. The larvae were pale white in color, just the average Samia. Bloodline C, Samia Ricini Mini, was growing relatively well in my opinion. One thing I did notice, however, is that the larvae were relatively small. As I've raised Samia Ricini several times in my life, it's easy to immediately notice the size differences. The size of the moths depends on a lot of factors, such as nutrition, but also their level of hydration. Yes, dry food blunt produces smaller moths, but it can also be genetic. A classic example of nature versus nurture. 
If you want to raise big moths, make sure the caterpillars have enough to drink. Water makes a huge difference. And use plants that are in season, especially if they are flowering or growing fresh leaves. Then you'll get the most out of your animals. This is the final instar. Compare them to other final instars in my other videos. And I think you will see how small these are in comparison. Thankfully they would still eat and grow a little bit, but not significantly. And soon they would become more plump. I was sure that they would be very close to cocooning any time, unaware of the crazy thing that was about to happen. Hey, what's up there moth fans? I was just looking at our Samia and I noticed something really cool. Let me show you what I found for a second. Have to be careful here with the cage. You don't want to hurt them. Ta -ta 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 -ta. Wait for it. Nope, that's not it. Wait for it. Wait for it. Ah, there we go. See this? We have cocoons, can you see this? And look at the silk of these pieces, it is high quality silk. This is commercial grade silk. Wow. Take a look, the first cocoons. Yes, this bloodline is very inbred. But still it was possible to raise them to cocoons effectively, so I guess that their vitality was not affected that much. To some degree they are resistant to inbreeding, because even very weak individuals are easy to raise in captivity. They don't die, they just become small or crippled. The first sign of trouble, however, was that some caterpillars started to pupate without spinning cocoons. This is unusual and often a sign of stress. Healthy caterpillars should spin cocoons, but these weird ones just try to poop pupate on the floor. Still, I had many caterpillars left of Bloodline C, Samia Ritsini Mini. Despite half of them cocooning, others decided to continue to feed and grow a little bit longer than the rest. Just take a look at this fat little bunch here. There you go, more cocoons. And now the waiting game is about to begin. I let the larva who didn't spin cocoons pupate in special containers with a soft paper towel at the bottom. But I immediately noticed the pupa look somewhat abnormal. There was this was another sign that something weird was going on with these insects. Once again I had to wait for about a month, but thanks to the magic of YouTube it will only seem like a few seconds. Are you eager to see the moths? Alright, there we go. This is seriously, seriously strange. Not only were the moths smaller, their entire wing shape was just totally off. Their wings, for example, aren't curved, but almost diamond shaped. I'm going to be honest and say it was cute in its own disturbing way. Hey everyone, good news. Hey everyone, bad news. I'm not sure what to say. My uh, Sami Aritsini just hatched, as you can see. That's the good news. But they look very bizarre. This is just so weird. These are the most oddly shaped, tiniest, smallest Sami Aritsini that I have seen in my life. And trust me, I've seen a lot of these guys in my life, okay? This is just crazy. Everything about them is just weird. Their shape, their color, their size. Uh, the breeding was a success, because obviously I produced moths. But I'm not yet satisfied. I'm going to have to breed another bloodline. Because the genes of these dudes, this genetics, is something is seriously weird here. 
And I do want my animals to be re representative for this pieces on YouTube, so... Crazy, look at that. The antennae were also extremely small and the body seemed to be more compacted. And please notice their face. Such big eyes in comparison to their very tiny antennae and compact heads. Truly unusual morphology. I decided to admire these moles, but I also decided not to continue to breed them. It's better for bloodlines like these to go extinct to be honest, since breeding them with siblings will only continue to make them bigger freaks of nature each generation. But take a good look, I guess this is still a unique moment on my YouTube channel, though I didn't really plan for this to happen. Another thing these moths would do is they would sit on one spot and flap themselves to exhaustion. Almost as if they were trying to fly but were unable to. Perhaps their wings were too small, making them unable to fly through the air. This behavior is pretty bad for them because these moths have no functioning mouth and cannot eat. They only live for about a week, which is enough to mate, lay eggs and die. So it's really important for them to conserve energy. The constant flapping of these bloodlines see Samyari Sini mini individuals shorten their lifespan. They would flop until they were exhausted and sometimes then just die. I'm not exactly sure if this behavior is caused by a genetic defect or if they were just trying to fly but their wings were too small. How sad and how curious. One thing I would like to do is take all these horrible bloodlines and make them healthy again by crossing them with strong and wild animals. That would be quite beneficial. A rejuvenation of captive insects with wild genes. And this got me thinking, as I still felt sort of bad for them. And then I had a revelation. What if I improved their bloodline? What if I could work some of my moth magic and produce healthy offspring for these freaks of nature? Hmm. Why is inbreeding a bad thing for animals anyways? Inbreeding increases the risk of recessive disorders. They receive one copy of the gene from each parent. Animals that are closely related are more likely to carry a copy of the same recessive gene. This increases the risk that they will both pass a copy of the gene to their offspring. This usually leads to at least temporary decreased biological fitness. Inbreeding often affects livestock and domestic animals that reproduce in captivity since some breeders or farmers cross brothers with sisters. So I started thinking, what if I imported a wild species of Samia and crossed them with these domesticated Samia ricini? Would it result in healthier offspring? And what species should I use? I did happen to have a few wild Samia species in stock. These olive green animals are wild Samia cynthia, for example. Behind the scenes I breed those as well. They are totally different from Samia ricini and much bigger. Imagine crossbreeding these amazing animals with our Samia Ricini mini bloodline. What would the offspring look like? They could bring some of their amazing olive green color into the bloodline. But I also had other species in stock, such as the impressive and big Samia Luzonica from the Philippines. This species is very big and has a spectacular fluorescent pink to purple submarginal line. And their wingspan is impressive, especially the females. That would create a crazy hybrid. Sick animals, deformed animals, genetically inferior inbred, weak Samia bloodlines. I was getting kind of sick of it at this point. They have to be restored to their glory. It makes me truly sad to see how many people are on purpose breeding animals that are crippled, inbred and deformed. And therefore, I am forced to do this. I didn't want to do this, but I have to, for the moth's sake. We are going to do an experiment that will improve their genes and vitality. Let's go. Can it be done? Oh yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is time to face my ultimate creation. It will be the pinnacle of Samia. I usually don't like to make hybrids, but you really forced my hand here. You done goofed. Consequences will never be the same. I am forced to reveal my full power level. I'm going to design my own hybrid of Samia. One that will be better than the rest. We shall call it Samia Hybrid Copensi. 
which is a Bloodline mix of Bloodline C, Samia Ricini Mini and Samia Luzonica. I am sick of it. I am sick of it and I cannot take this anymore. Seeing how many of these animals have been crippled by inbreeding, how they have been reduced to these pathetic deformed animals that people keep breeding on purpose. That breaks my heart and I am forced to do this. I don't usually do this but it's time. It's time to get to work and improve these moths. It is time to improve their genetics and I think I know exactly what to do. You see, it concerns me to see all this inbreeding in captivity. All these weak, pathetic bloodlines. And if nobody else is going to fix them, I will have to do it myself. So we are going to do a hybrid experiment on YouTube. I am going to create a new strain of Samia. One that is bigger, better and healthier. My own creation. Let's start. What's up everyone? Today you are going to witness the birth of a new race of Samia Rizzini. Do you remember these pathetically small individuals that I bred before? Well, I decided not to continue their bloodline. Because these animals are so small and deformed, it would almost be cruel to keep breeding these strange miniature and miniature versions of what a moth really is. But I ha happen to breed something else. This is a giant Samia. Well, it's not a giant. This is the normal size of a wild species of Samia. This is Samia Luzonica from the Philippines. Do you see the difference? And I'm going to combine this beautiful insect with wild genes with these inbred little mutts and see what a combination will produce and I'm going to call it Samia Copensi. Am I allowed to give them new names? Well the scientific name Samia Rizzini is 
bound to the rules of taxonomic nomenclature, so you can't just give a species a new name. However, the names that the races and strains have, there's no official rules for it. So if I like, if someone else can call something a Sami Ericini zebra, then I can surely call this Sami Ericini copensi. It's going to be a fun project. Whatever the hell these two are going to be if I combine them into one. Hmm. Because two different species can have problems mating, I just decided to hand pair them, since I am reasonably good at hand pairing silk moths. Hand pairing means manually pairing a male and a female. You just press their abdomens together in the correct angle and if possible, help to assist in the male opening his claspers for the female and after a while it did seem like both partners were cooperative and slowly but surely initiated mating. Samia luzonica is a wild species from the Philippines. It's the big one here on top, a female. As you can see, she is big and beautiful compared to the domesticated Ricini. But Ricini males are so sexual, horny, that they will pair with any other species of Saturnid, especially other Samia species. This makes hybridization like this very easy to do in captivity. And I wonder if this pairing will be fertile. Just look at the size difference. I hope it will be. There you go. A mating between two species. This was about to be the beginning of my hybrid moth quest. I had no idea what the babies were going to look like at this point. In over 10 years of breeding moths, this was my first hybrid ever. Well, 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 would you look at that. Female laid a bunch of eggs. So that's usually a sign that she is fertilized. So it turns out there's a chance that our Samia Ritsini Copensi, that's what I'm gonna call them, are a thing. Righty then. Let me just scoop those eggs here up in a petri dish. Yes, it's correct. Oh, some more eggs. Some more eggs. The first thing to do is to collect the eggs in a petri dish. The eggs would hatch in about two weeks time, as is normal for almost any Samia. It's alive. Oh God, it's alive. Here they are. The first Samia Ritsini Copensi, our Frankenstein creation of an insect. I'm not going to explain how to breed them once again. In this video you saw me breeding the same animal three times. Okay, that's plenty for you. So just gonna go through this process very fast. Oh, by the way, normally I scoop up the babies, but uh, these are so many babies, I'll just play it, place it them in here. Yep, that's right, this is very lazy. But I don't want to remove all those individual babies, it's going to be hours of work and I may end up hurting them because there are so many, there's no efficient way I can scoop them up because I should just be crushing them, so I'll just place some Tasty sweet gum leaves here on top. Samia loves sweet gum. Not many people know that, but they do. So there you go. My babies find your food. One day later, they were feeding pretty well. That means, yes, we are off to a good start. I tried my very best. It's the first hybrid I ever tried to make. I'm not sure why that is. I have always been more interested in pure species than in hybrids. It's not that I am ethically against it or anything, it's just that I am really someone who approaches moths from a wildlife perspective and hybrids are a bit too artificial for my taste. But who knows, maybe we can try more in the future. We shall see. Insta number 2 already. Unfortunately, the babies started eating all their food as soon as they could finish it. Clearly, I needed to give them an upgrade in space. 
So I collected some sweet gum leaves and placed them in a beer can containing tap water. This allowed the plant to stay fresh. And next I took the caterpillars that were resting in their plastic container and placed them in a smaller cage, where they would have more space to feed and grow. To this change of environment the caterpillars responded pretty well honestly. In the second instar they seemed pretty dark in color. Dark yellow in color, sorry. However, there were signs that the first caterpillars were molting to instar number three, in which they turned white. From the small cage, I placed them into an even bigger cage. I was hoping they would thrive in here. The more food and the more space, the better, I suppose. Slowly, some of them were shedding skins until their next instar. Take a look! It started with a few white individuals. But then in instar 3, they were white with interesting black markings. At this point they sort of reminded me of the zebra Samia that I raised before in this video. So it looks like the Samia hybrid Copansi will be having black markings. Exciting! The mother species, which is Samia lusodica, does have larvae with black spots as well, so it was not surprising. So far the growth, the growth rate was good, and so was the size. It's pretty exciting to raise something of which you are not even sure what it will look like eventually. Now in this stage they look pretty interesting with the black dots. But the most exciting change was about to happen in the next instar. Let me ask you. What do you think they will look like when they shed their skins? Well, take a look. Oh my god, that's pretty intense, isn't it? These hybrids were pretty fascinating and really colorful too. The prettiest freaks of nature that I have ever witnessed. However, with increased size comes increased appetite. I decided to collect my larvae and later give them a much better new home. Ladies and gentlemen. Oh my god, I am so super proud of this. Look at them! These dudes are some of the most amazing caterpillars of Samia I have seen in captivity. And the best part is I created these myself. They are my own breeding experiment. Wow! Look at that! And there are so many of them. Guys, we have to be really careful. But if you look down here you will see just how many caterpillars there are. Can you see it? Wow! And the color is out of this world. Now usually on my channel I don't do a lot of hybrid experiments. This is a first time for my YouTube channel. I am not morally opposed to it. It's just that usually I am more interested in studying wild species than hybrids. But in this case it strongly benefits the animals because in captivity they tend to be inbred and crippled. You've seen the parents, their genetics have deteriorated very strongly because of uh, inbred bloodlines and careless breeding. So in this case by hybridizing them and crossing them with wild species I hope to restore their beauty and restore their vitality. And it seems to be working. Look at the Samia Kopensi. Feast your eyes on these magnificent creatures, because I don't think we will ever see anything similar again on my channel. 
They had orange red tubercules and the pigmentation seemed to vary per individual moth. How amazing! I bought this giant moth breeding cage. It's an expensive joke, but for this project it's necessary because I don't really want to overcrowd these dudes and they need a lot of food because they have a lot of caterpillars. I'm going to place, I could live in here, see? I'm going to place my Samia in here. The freak Samia. The Copensi Samia. I can't wait. How do we even introduce these guys? I don't know. Alright, so I just like stuck the whole ball of caterpillars up there. I don't know if this will work or if it's a stupid idea. I guess we're gonna find out. I hope they don't fall down. That could hurt them. But I see many of them dispersing, so that's good news. Here is the final instar, instar number 5. They were getting close to cocooning now. Wow, look at this legendary beast. Samia hybrid Copensi was growing excellent so far. And it was definitely possible to see traits of the wild Luzonica and the larva. Can you see the similarities? Do you have suggestions of other hybrids I could make? Please let me know in the comments. So the larva just went their own way. So far they were easy to raise, but hybrids are tricky creatures. In my opinion, raising hybrids is always a little bit more difficult than pure species. They strike me as more sensitive animals in captivity that become sick easier than most insects. So do you have to be careful if you are rearing them? I was hoping that this would be a strain that could be re redistributed to other breeders to make Samia bloodlines stronger. But you never know how experiments like these turn out in the end. Oh, if you've been watching this video for this long, you are a true fan. Let me know in the comments. Do people really watch these excessively long episodes and special moth videos? I'm super enthusiastic and can talk about them for hours, but finding fans who feel the same are difficult to find. Now this is crazy, huh? This is an excellent moth cage. It's XXL, it's the biggest, one of the biggest cages I have for big breeding projects. Um, I didn't buy it myself, it was given to me when I was a consultant for the butterfly farm in Cambodia. I researched butterflies and moths for two months in uh, Cambodia and Laos. The videos of that are still on my channel, although they are low quality because it was well, it was one and a half year ago, and uh, back then I really didn't know how to film and edit it well. I've become much better at it. So the videos are old and grainy, but check it out if you like. But as a reward for wor working at the butterfly farm, of course they paid me money uh, as a butterfly and moth breeding consultant. But another thing I got was a gift in the form of a lot of breeding cages. Like, and I'm talking a lot of breeding cages. So uh, they gave me about 10 uh, medium sized and a few of these big guys, which is also an excellent gift. It's not salary, it's not payment in dollars. Of course, I made the money as well. They paid me a salary in dollars, but this was a bonus. And these cages, the big ones are kind of expensive. So, uh, but from time to time, they come in handy. And so, sorry, I cannot tell you where to buy them. But I'm just telling you, it's possible to buy them somewhere on the internet. I'm not sure where. But uh, this is excellent if you have a lot of caterpillars so you can contain them, but give them the space they need. I could live in it. But then something magical happened. A few caterpillars crawled into the corners of the enclosures and started spinning. Yay, is that cocoons? My god, finally. They were spinning silk. That means that yes, oh god, finally, they're about to cocoon and then turn into moths. I was really, really excited to see this and see the first cocoons forming. This is good news, but unfortunately there was also bad news. Ladies and gentlemen, excellent news. The cocooning is happening in full process. Whoa, pulled out three cocoons at once. See? It's pretty cool. But there's more. Up, uh, yes. 
dead caterpillars. Unfortunately, there was bad news. Some of the dead Copensi hybrid caterpillars started to die for reasons unknown. That really sucks. Why are they beginning to die? It could be a pathogen like a bacteria or a virus. Or are they just not genetically compatible? Maybe the hybrids are weak. Ladies and gentlemen, we have some good news and some bad news. The good news is we produced a lot of cocoons. Can you see them? Here in this cage are our first cocoons of the hybrid. But there is also some bad news and the bad news is this. Dead caterpillars. Every day now, it seems, every day that I wake up, more and more caterpillars start to die. This is unfortunate. I'm not sure why it is. Do you think it is because maybe the hybrid I made is too weak to survive? Or maybe they just got sick and got an infection. You see, it's, it's, not, it's not weird, it's not strange for your caterpillars to get an infection. Maybe it has nothing to do with them being hybrids. It can also happen randomly. Any moth breeder will tell you in the comments this is true. I don't believe there's anyone who never had a virus in their breeding. But no worries. So uh, I haven't counted yet. But let's say that this is at least 20 cocoons. So if the worst happens and all the caterpillars die, then we're at least guaranteed to see the moths. Although I, I am trying my best to get rid of the disease. But that could be, that could be difficult because it's a big group of caterpillars and I fear for a lot of them it could be too late. Yeah, so we're just going to see uh, what happens. I'm going to keep these at room temperature. And hope that they close pretty soon. The good news is I had a ton of caterpillars. I had so much caterpillars in fact that it didn't matter that some of them died. Even with a higher mortality rate I would end up with enough cocoons to see a nice amount of Samia hybrid Copensi adult moths. A higher survival rate would have been better in my opinion, but hey, I'm glad at least some of them made it to the cocoon phase. Hybridization is not easy. It's generally for more experienced breeders. Here we also see a whole bunch of cocoons, but there's caterpillars still cocooning, so I'm going to leave those alone for now. The good news is that I still got a nice amount of cocoons, despite the high mortality in the final instars. Look at them! They're a bit bronze or coppery brown in color. Certainly an interesting variation. Now, these cocoons wouldn't just hatch casually, unfortunately. It took, lo it took longer than regular Samelia ricini. I guess the Coppensi hybrids are just as slow and lazy as the actual Mr. Coppens. But then, when I least expected it, are you ready to see the moths that came out? I'm warning you, they are so special you must calm your nerves or you will get a heart attack. There we go. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Oh my god, look at that beauty. Such an extreme moth. The hybrid Samia Copensi were exactly what I would wished for. Just look at that. Such amazing animals, don't you agree? Their purple submarginal bands radiated out over their wings into a dark area in their wing margins. Oh my god. I can't believe it. It's alive. It's alive! <laughs> the experiment was successful and my own hybrid creation has sprung into existence.
I cannot believe this. These are my own creation. A combination of two species in captivity who I can't wait to see the result. Let's take a closer look at my hybrid animal. Something about the Copensi hybrids was very interesting. They were either small or giants. No exceptions. There were no intermediates between small or very big. This is interesting because their mother was a giant Luzonica and their dad a tiny Ricini Mini. Some of them inherited their mother's size and some of them inherited their father's size. But there were no intermediates. This tells us something about the heritability of size in Saturnid moths. They get it from either one of their parents, I guess. Now here is something that I find very fascinating. Remember the parents that we used to make the hybrid? We used one very, very small male of the Mini Ricini, remember that? And one big female of the Lutsonica, remember that? The size difference in the parents was huge. And what's interesting is that we can see this in the offspring. I have two types of hybrids. I have mini hybrids, which are like these, the small ones. And I have really big hybrids. And there is nothing in between. As you can see, these one have the big genes, basically their mother's genes, their mother's size. And they are much bigger than any normal Ricini is. They are huge. On the other hand, the small ones who have their father's size here, the tiny ones, are very small. Can you see it? That's interesting. Let's take another moment to marvel at these creatures. I don't care that this video is super long. You all deserved it as a reward for crowdfunding me. Now graze upon my creations. What do you think about them? Do you like them as well? Do you agree they are prettier than most Sami are raised in captivity? Oh my god, wow. Ladies and gentlemen, our first hybrid babies are here and I am beyond pleased. Look at this, I made this myself. And their colors are amazing. Look at that purple. They definitely inherited the purple from their uh, Samia Luzonica mother. Um, overall the colors are really amazing and gorgeous. Wow. Now the funny thing is these are five males. Males. So... If I want to continue the line, a female needs to show up soon. But that all depends on luck, unfortunately. So ladies and gentlemen, let's hope I will be lucky enough to uh, have a female. That would be awesome. Wow, my first hybrid on YouTube. Well, that's not true. There's other hybrids on my channel, but this is the first hybrid I made myself. Wow. They were also very active when it comes to flying. Pure Samia Ricini are often lazy and prefer to flap or crawl around. But these are very strong and active flyers. I guess it's the wild genes acting up here. They were also more strictly nocturnal, preferring to pair in darkness. So now I just needed one more thing to get the job done, and that is pairings. Interestingly, I had a lot of meals, but that makes sense since males come out of the cocoons first, way before females do. Anyways, the point of making the Sami a hybrid copensi was not just for entertainment, but also to produce a stronger bloodline with genes that can hopefully spread around the world and rejuvenate the health of Samias around the, gro the globe. But with only males that is not possible. There she is, a female. Wow, she was a whopper. Look at that size, impressive. Finally, the males would have something to get busy with. Easy pickings, boys. Wow. Wow, 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 wow. Oh my god. 
One thing I want you guys to do is please appreciate the size of this hybrid monster. She is at least twice the size of any Sami Ericini that I have seen. She is so, so big. I hope that when I pair her with a male, her offspring is going to be just that big. Oh my God. She's almost like a small atlas moth, to be honest. Simply incredible. I have rarely seen such a big specimen of Samia. I wonder if it's the hybrid genes that's making her bigger than normal. She's even bigger than the Lizoniaca mother and the small Ricini father. Wow. This is just incredible. Look at that. This is just super amazing. One of the biggest Samia that I have ever raised. The color is just gorgeous. My God. Thankfully pairings were easy. The males and females quickly hooked up as you can see. That means that the generation would continue. Finally. I love a good conclusion to my breeding projects. It is really satisfying. There they are! Yay! Eggs! Finally it is time for our eggs. My plan was to sell them to other breeders and trade with them to other breeders so they can use the genes to improve their bloodline. These are the capsules of eggs I was going to sell to various breeders. And now I am sending them to one of my customers. Keep in mind I very rarely sell things online, so please don't inbox me to buy eggs. I probably won't sell anything, although I do make an exception for patrons who are subscribed to my Patreon. But only if you live in a place where this is legal. I don't want to guess, risk getting my fans in legal trouble or break the law in places where exotic animals cannot be imported without permits. I follow the law. That would be bad publicity for me and I don't want to get my fans into trouble. I even included my business card. Fancy, isn't it? Into the mailbox they go. Bye bye. And then the moths died and the life cycle has ended. Bye bye friends. Before we continue, I have to explain something to you. Something about eerie silk. You see the moths that you saw in this video, as I mentioned before, are often purely raised for the production of silk. The special type of silk these moths produce is named Eri silk, and it's used to make real products. All silk fibers are made out of two proteins, sericin and fibroin. Fibroin is the interior protein and sericin is the outer gummy protein that helps the fibers to stick together, giving the cocoons its structural integrity. Sericin, a very gummy substance, has to be washed off so that the strings of the fiber can be separated. Only when the strands are separate, we can spin the silk yarn. So first the cocoons are degummed before they can be used and flattened. Degumming happens by rinsing the cocoons for a long time in soapy water. The flat cocoons are called cocoon cakes. The warm soapy water removes the gum, or the sericin in this case. After processing, the silk becomes softer and easier to handle. After the degumming, the silk is then dried and sometimes also bleached and dyed, giving it the colors if needed. This makes the silk more workable for spinning purposes. And then, the silk is actually spun. Spun silk is made from short lengths obtained from damaged cocoons or broken off during processing and twisted together to make yarn. Yarns of silk are also sold commercially. This yarn can then in turn be used to process further into clothing or items. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, the breeding of Samia Rizzini is in my opinion an art form. It is an art form, yes, it is a form of art. To breed your own unique bloodline with its own unique colors, its own unique shape, Hybrids, big moths, small moths, caterpillars with zebra stripes. 
it's possible to artificially select these in captivity in such a way many breeders can create their own unique strains of Samia Rizzini. Yep. But something is very important to remember in all of this. And I'm going to tell you what. You see, uh, so far I have told you about the hobby, breeding these insects for fun. But these insects uh, are not just a hobby animal for you and me to enjoy for fun. Because these moths, the Sami and Ricini, they sustain millions, probably, of lives with a livelihood. As I mentioned before in this video, Sami and Ricini are domesticated silk moths. That means that in captivity, they have been raised to produce silk for many centuries. In India, this has become somewhat of a um, traditional practice. Some of you know the history of India, the Silk Road, and how it all ties into the uh, ancient production of silk, and the domestication of these moths for high quality silk. Much like how modern cows are domesticated to produce a lot of milk, sheep are domesticated to produce a lot of wool, and chickens lay an abnormal amount of eggs, Samia Rizzini is a domesticated insect to produce the highest quality silk. And guess what I have here today? This was what I ordered from India, from a real silk farm. This is Samia Rizzini silk. These are called cocoon cakes, the flattened cocoons of Samia Rizzini. And the quality is remarkable. It is really, really soft. But here I also had some, some other silk. This is some real silk product from India that I ordered just to show you in a video. It's very expensive, by the way. But uh, this video is a special one for you. So I'm going all the way. First of all, here I have some uh, silk yarn from Eri Silk. Now, I have to tell you guys this is made from the actual silk of this guy, Sami Ericini. I uh, ordered it from an Eri silk, uh, silk farm made in Mecha Halaya, India. Maybe some people from India know the location. And it's, it's really wonderful that I can show you this on YouTube. Because it, in my opinion it's super important to remember that these insects don't just exist for your entertainment or my entertainment. They are actually very important domesticated animals that sustain a million dollar industry that provides people with work and with clothing, which is very important. Of course, uh, recently India has been growing well. India is economic powerhouse. Uh, it's a country I find very interesting. But... Um, Let's be real, the economy in India can still use some improvement, but so can the economy of other countries where this insect is farmed, such as, uh, for example, Vietnam, I think, Thailand, uh, even in parts of Africa, people farm these silk moths for income. And it's very important that these people can make money, especially in developing countries, right? It's uh, very hard there to uh, get by. If you live in a developing country, it's hard to survive, it's hard to pay the bills. And these mostly bring a solution. And what, what I'm really trying to say here is, uh, these insects are not just an entertainment animal. They are a serious domesticated uh, animal um, who are tied to a, an ancient practice and a very important million dollar industry. So I hope you understand that these moths are also culturally significant, okay? Not just for YouTubers like you and me who like playing with moths. This is serious business. Sami Ericini is serious business. It's one of the world's most important moths in terms of the economical significance together with species like the Bombyx mori, the, um, the mulberry silk moth, who probably produce enough silk 
to uh, well provide millions of people with clothing and with jobs. And I think that's something people don't regularly uh, think about. But I think it should be mentioned on YouTube. So now I'm going to show you some silk products. First of all, let me show you the cocoon cakes and tell you something about them. Cocoon cakes. <coughs> Here are the gum cocoons that I talked about. When the sea resin is removed, these are flattened silk cocoons of Samia Ricini, the Eri silk moth. I actually imported them from a real silk farm in India. These great AD gummed silk cocoons are a totally, totally natural product that can be spun into yarn with just a little stretching. You can create some lovely fun art yarns. They are uh, ready to dye if required. The degumming process releases the sticky substance that holds the silk strands or the cocoons together, resulting in a rough cocoon shape, but much more fluffy. And here is some authentic silk yarn. Indeed, it feels very soft to the touch. Very lovely, don't you think? Yes, made from the same moth species. Reeled or filament silk is the highest quality yarn and is very white and shiny. First, the cocoons are wow. inspected and sorted, as only those with a perfect shape can be it's used really for the reeling soft. procedure. Cocoons are soaked in warm water to soften the gummy sericin. The silken strand from a single cocoon is too fine to use alone, so individual filaments of 60 to 20 cocoons are unraveled at the same time, traveling through a very small eye. The soft and sericine dries, hardens and binds the strands together to become one thread the size of a human hair. The majority of real silk supply large industry looms. The last thing that I want to show you is something really special I want to show you. It's a real hat made from Eri silk of the Samia Ricini silk moss. In India, uh, I gotta say the fabric, it feels, it feels really nice. I'm serious. You know the expression, silky smooth? Well, this is why I understand why people say the expression silky smooth. Because it feels really, really, really soft and nice, to be honest. It's winter right now, perfect season to try it out. <laughs> Let's see. Do I look good in the hat, guys? Wow, it's an, an interesting look. I look bald, my hairline is like receding or something. Oh my god. I'm, I'm becoming old, guys. Let me, let me properly put it on. I think that's uh, oh that's that's a bit better. It feels good. I'm not going to lie. It feels really good. Wow. I think I'm a fan of silk. How could I not be? And it's pretty amazing to think that somewhere in India, using these moths, the silk of their cocoons has been processed all the way into this hat that I'm wearing right now. Oh my God. A real eerie silk hat and the quality is amazing. Uh, I'm gonna wear this to be honest. I uh, purchased it just uh, to make a YouTube video. But I actually really like the feeling. It's, I'm not joking, I'm not chilling. Silk is, uh, it feels better than the, uh, than the fake fabric you often get in the store. You know the, the, the synthetic uh, textiles, the synthetic uh, Stuff they make clothing from it also f always feels a bit tight and uh, very warm. But the hat, it feels like it's, I don't know, it feels a bit ventilated, it breathes a little bit, you know. If you put on some caps of uh, synthetic, uh, I don't know what they use nowadays to make synthetic textile, but the hat feels really warm. But this one feels like it's, it's ventilated. And it's comfortable. Wow. Here it is. Bart Cobbins with a real Samia Ricini silk hat. That's pretty amazing, no? And here just goes to show 
Really, I want to get the point across, all right? This is not just entertainment, okay? These moths are not fun. They are serious business for, for thousands and thousands of people in Asia, in Africa. It's a whole industry. Now, the only downside I can imagine uh, about a hat like this is the price. Silk is expensive. This uh, hat, it costs uh, $40. It's not somebody, it's something that most people can uh, afford, maybe. Well, $40 is not that much, but uh, it's a lot just uh, for one uh, uh, silk hat, I guess. But yeah. I uh, bought this from a real silk farm in India. So the money for the purchase, I purchased a lot of silk. It was expensive, guys. But the money goes to the people in India who make this. It's uh, homemade from a real silk factory and uh, I really hope it will be used to uh, sustainably help the people in India. Now, I don't want to sound like India is some kind of uh, starving country who deserves our pity. That's not true. India is a beautiful uh, country with a rich history and I would love to visit it someday. But let's be real, some people there, they do need economic boost. That's, that's the reality. All right, don't want to sound too negative. But uh, with my purchase of silk, I have also contributed a little bit to the livelihood of these people in India, who, let's be honest, deserve it more than some people uh, in my country. Wow, let's admire it for a second. The real Eri Silk Samia Ricini hat before we go to the next segment. <laughs> Here we go. I hope you enjoyed it. This was Bart with the real Airy Silk products for you on YouTube. Let's go to the next segment. I have more to tell you. Ladies and gentlemen, during the production of this Moss Cycles episode, and perhaps also during your viewing experience, it may have become pretty clear that I know a lot about these insects about these Samia moths. I know a lot of information about them because I have studied them pretty well. Now, I am not really much of a scientist. I'm really just a very enthusiastic boy with a camera that, may, that likes to make YouTube videos about his favorite animals, which happen to be insects. But people often and frequently ask me, Bart, how can you know all these things? Why do you know so much information? Because other people are looking for this information online, on Google, for example, and they fail to, to find anything significant. And then they see me with my expertise. Of course, I try not to brag about myself. I am just a humble YouTuber, like I said. Not that much of a scientist, but I think I know more about these insects than the average person and the average, the average, uh, I guess, moth hobbyist. That's why my channel is so successful. So where the hell do I get all this information? Books, ladies and gentlemen. One mistake people nowadays make is to look for all the information online, on the internet. Unfortunately, this does not work. Of course, there are guys like me on YouTube who love to educate people about the world of entomology. But unfortunately, the science of entomology is a little bit outdated. And the internet has not caught up with the modern knowledge of these insects because most of it is still contained in books. And when people are always so amazed how it's possible for me to have this much knowledge, I know that sounds arrogant to say, but I take pride in the level of knowledge I have. I had to study hard for it and I had to read a lot of these books. I know books, they still exist. It would be surprised, especially for young people uh, who are nowadays always on their smartphone and their laptop and their Google and YouTube without sounding like a boomer, because obviously I too am a social media worker, I love social media, 
I love the internet. But I have to say the internet is not an adequate place to learn about insects. Therefore, um, I am going to help other people like you, because you want to become an expert as well. Just, uh, just like me, right? And if you want to be an expert like me, you have to read. You have to read books. It's important. This book, for example, which is uh, a revision of the silk moth genus Samia, is a, a scientific work produced by Richard S. Peichler and Stefan Naumann, who are two big scientists when it comes to the Saturnidae, one of the two most prominent Saturnidae scientists at the moment. And this work they produce contains an enormous level of knowledge. Just take a look at this. This book, it has all the Samia species that are described right now taxonomically with pictures and information. This book is hundreds and hundreds of pages. Here's even all the caterpillars of all the Samia species. Even their genitals, which are important for research. And here are hundreds and hundreds of pages of information. Yes, hundreds of pages. I am not kidding you. Hundreds of pages of information about Samia moths. There is no website on the internet. There is not one website on the internet where you can find information like this. And the reason that I know all these things and other people don't is because I still read books. And it seems nowadays young people have forgotten how to read books. Truth is, if you want to become a good entomologist, you have to read. Because YouTube, because Google are not going to give you the information that you need. So therefore, I am now going to review the book a revision of the silk moth genus Samia. A very, very important book in the study of Saturnidae and the study of the genus Samia. A revision of the silk moth genus Samia, published by Richard Peichler and Stefan Naumann in 2003, is a massive recommendation if you have the scientific interest in the silk moth genus Samia. It is one of the most comprehensive revisions of this genus, accurate up to the year 2003. One feature that I really liked is that it has color plates of the type specimens of many Samia species, making it convenient to identify them. It's also a great way to familiarize yourself with the numerous species of Samia that exist on our planet, which is very helpful to both beginners and experts. Not only that, a wide selection of caterpillars is also being included. Not only is this book helpful when it comes to identifying several species of Samia as adults, but also as larvae, which is harder to do, as there are fewer resources for larval identification. Of course, at its core and essence, the book is a taxonomic work. Taxonomic revisions include many papers in which new arrangements shifts in the rank of position and some of the included taxa are proposed. In a generic or family revision, complete descriptions are usually given for every species, whether or not they have been described before, something which this book all does with all described species of Samia up to 2003. It also offers the geographical distribution, a diagnosis for identification and an in, um, and an including a list of some of the examined specimens. Also rather fascinating is the inclusion of information when it comes to certain textiles composed of eerie silk and their origins. Historical samples of Samia silk and on top of that also included are the genital plates of male and female Samia. For those unaware, the morphology of the genitalia is an important tool that Lepidopterists use to accurately identify species. Also included are additional notes on the host plants that are commonly used to raise these species, and some allied genera. 
Overall, it is a wonderful little book that I would recommend for both beginners and experts. In total, it covers 19 different species of Samia. Obviously, the taxonomic revision is going to help any researcher looking to publish when it comes to species in the genus Samia, but the color plates, the distributions and the faunistics of all other species included are helpful to any beginner as well. It contains lists of host plants along with distributions, which is massively useful for aspiring breeders as well. Highly recommended for any enthusiast that likes silk moths. This was Bart Coppens with another episode of Let's Read Together, my online web series where I recommend or review interesting books. Follow my channel and subscribe for more book recommendations. Bye bye, moth fans. If you want to buy this book, I will try to put a link, perhaps in the comments or in the description of my video. So you can buy the book as well from the same source where uh, I bought it. So perhaps you have the same version, the same language as my version, of course. Uh, it also saves you some time trying to search the internet for places where you can buy this very particular book. But uh, this is one of the uh, biggest tips I can give you right now. If you are interested in these insects and want to learn more, this is one of the best, it is the best work right now that you should read. Ah yes, Samiericini. What precisely, my dear viewers, is a Samiericini anyways? There is an interesting story behind this species you should be aware of. You see, the story of Samiericini is a story of domestication. Believe it or not, but this species of moth is more or less created by humans. Much like a house cat, a chicken or a dog, they are not a wild species that is found anywhere in the wild. In fact, Samia Ricini depends on being taken care of by humans in captivity in order to survive, which makes them quite interesting. Humans have domesticated a big variety of animals, but not many people know this. This includes a few species of insects as well. The Eerie silkworm has been cultivated for centuries in the production of high-quality silk cocoons. The type of silk produced by these moths is named Eri silk and breeding these insects is a booming industry in many countries in Asia but also in Africa. Is Samia ricini even a species? What's interesting about this moth is that we honestly don't know. What's interesting is the name Samia ricini. This is where things get complicated. Interestingly, the original description of Samia ricini appears to have been lost. When one uh, tries to find the original description, it's a dead end. In some papers from the late 1700s to 1800s, the name Phalanea ricini is mentioned, but none of them are original descriptions. This is curious, especially considering how taxonomy works and how the description and revision of any species depends on the original description. From a scientific and taxonomical perspective, Samia ricini is very unusual. The nomenclature is unstable. What makes this question even more complicated is the fact this species is domesticated. For example, dogs are the domesticated version of wolves, and we do not treat dogs and wolves as a separate species. So why should we treat Samia ricini as a separate species? Not to mention the original description cannot even be found. Does this moth deserve a binomial name? And if so, Why don't we treat dogs and wolves as a separate species, for example? And why do we treat Samia ricini as a separate species? The answer is simply because of convenience. The problem is here. Samia ricini shares traits with wild Samia moths such as Samia caningi, Samia cynthia, Samia prieri and others. It's very hard to even determine what species were used to domesticate this insect in the first place. Perhaps Samia ricini is in some ways a domesticated polyhybrid. While this deserves no binomial, binomial classification by itself in the most technical sense, one should keep in mind that taxonomical nomenclature does not always have to be an accurate representation of nature. Instead, taxonomy is a tool that humans use to conveniently classify organisms. But in the end, this is nothing but an artificial construct. Much like the colors that we perceive, such as red, yellow, blue and green or purple, 
because colors are in reality a complex spectrum of wavelengths of the electromagnetic radiation that we translate to five or six basic colors that are based on our limited ability to perceive these colors. Much like this, in nature, in reality, there exists a spectrum of organisms and po populations of organisms that we translate to something we can conveniently classify based on our limited ability to perceive and categorize them. Despite that, Samia Ricini is an oddity that showcases shortcomings in the way we can classify organisms, because under the current taxonomical system, a domesticated polyhybrid can hardly be defined. The reason it is assigned a species name is one of mere convenience. An argument that I do support, by the way, since I believe taxonomy should not be used in a way that accurately reflects nature since that is impossible. Nature, taxonomy is merely a tool um, to use for our own convenience and any attempts to more accurately reflect the environment can be counterproductive. It is a unique moth and one of the most economically important species of moths to humans which for the convenience of classifying it should be assigned a binomial name, while at the same time it's perhaps one of the most scientifically questionable assignations considering the species origins and unstable nomenclature. One of the closest relatives of Samia ricini is thought to be a wild species, Samia cynthia. In fact, for a long time, Samia ricini was assumed to be a domesticated subspecies of Samia cynthia, the Samia cynthia ricini. While this is partially true, the full picture is more complex. Originally, this species originates from China and Korea, but humans have introduced it to Australia, America, Africa, Europe, and many places in Asia. Since this insect is closely, closely tied, to, tied to sericulture, yes, sorry, the accent is difficult. This species is often crossbred with Ricini. You see, here is the issue. There are many species of Samia across the globe. Each country has its own unique species, especially as the places where these moths are farmed have different microclimates. For example, there is evidence that in Assam, India, Ricini is often crossbred with Samia Kanihi, and in China or Korea with Samia Cynthia while in places like Vietnam they can be crossbred with Samia coli. This ends up making slightly different hybrids in different places across the world, corresponding to the presence of different wild species of Samia. Take note that these moths often are traded internationally and hybrids end up getting exchanged all over the world, eventually mixing them up. So basically, this species is locally hybridized with several other wild Samia species, and Livsog is often traded worldwide. This creates an interesting network of hybrid populations that are exchanged and thus mixed on a worldwide scale over time. And while there may be local differences, the presence of the genes of several other Samia species makes Samia ricini more or less a polyhybrid in some ways. There's, it's most likely that its domestication could have begun with a single Samia species, but at this point it's very hard to, um, to, to retrace to its origins. And since DNA barcoding is often done on the mitochondrial genes such as the cytochrome oxidase 1 gene, which are passed down via the mother, their true origin is often a bit hard to define. In India alone, the biggest producer of Eri silk, the Eri silk industry, was valued to be around 205 billion American dollars alone as of 2017. In India, the Assam region in particular is famous for its Eri silk. Make no mistake when I say these animals provide millions of people with a livelihood. The quality of these animals really depends on the availability of good bloodlines in my opinion. In the hobby market, the animals are often mass produced for profit or even as reptile food. This can lead to severe inbreeding and degradation of the animals to the point where the majority becomes crippled for instance. One tip I give to all breeders of this insect is try to source some excellent stock. It's highly recommended that more people try captive breeding experiments to improve these bloodlines. That would be great. For example, I have one friend in Italy that managed to raise huge Samia specimens. Check them out, some of them have wingspans of 14 cm to 16 cm, which is incredible. 
check out the, this big specimen compared to a normal specimen and see the size difference. This size was achieved by an optimal artificial diet and optimal temperatures combined with selective breeding of good quality individuals. Certainly some of the biggest that I have ever seen in my life so far. What do you think? Are you impressed? They're almost like a small atlas moth. The best host plants for this moth include Ligustrum or Privet, Hylanthus or Tree of Heaven, Prunus or Cherry, Salix or Willow, Ricinus communis or Castor plant, Cinnamomum camphora or Camphor tree, Liquid Amber or Sweet Gum, or Rus or Sumac, and many more unlisted plants. Artificial diet has also been developed for commercial breeding. Other unwritten host plants include Lilac, certain types of Holly, Crab Myrtle, Philodendron, and many more. Please, a moment of attention from all my fans for the crowdfunding segment starts. Yes! Yes, yes, we did it! We did it! It's finally finished! One of my most extensive videos that I have been working on for almost a full year showing four different bloodlines of Sami and Ricini in one video showing you the silk and much more. I hope you enjoyed it. I worked really hard on this. But before we go, there is one thing I really need and that is a few minutes of your attention. So I ask you, can I please have a few more minutes of your time? Thank you, I am grateful for that. See, here is the thing. I need your help. That's right. If you are watching this, I need your help. Why do I need your help? Because I am alone. I am alone. Why am I alone? Here is the problem. YouTube demonetized my entire channel. That means that when I upload a video like the one you're watching now, I don't make a single dollar from it when people click on the video. Most YouTubers are in the monetization program of YouTube and that means when people click on their videos, they make money from it. Now I am not here on YouTube to become rich and famous, I am here just to educate you about my favorite animals. But it is really, really damn hard to do all of this by myself, alone. And this is where your help comes in. You see, my fans paid for this. I have something that is called crowdfunding. That means that this channel is supported by the generous donations of, well, at the moment we have 83 fans who donate to me every month. And this gives me the budget to keep the show going. Otherwise, it would be completely impossible for me to work, to pay the bills, to breed all my insects, which is an expensive hobby, and make videos like this that take almost a year to produce. That is insane. Insane. And this video was a reward for when we hit the amount of $318 per month on Patreon, which happened last year. And since that happened, this video has been in production as a special reward. I hope you like it. But here is the thing. If you like the show, if you want more videos like this, if you like what I am doing and you would like to see it continue, consider supporting me financially. Consider subscribing to my Patreon for as little as one dollar a month. It helps me massively because I am here running the show more or less for free. And that is satisfying. I love how many people watch it. I love I have a big audience. But without the generous financial support of my fans, this channel would not exist. And videos like this would not be possible. Keep that in mind. Of course, I understand financially we are in difficult times. I appreciate 
every viewer, everybody who watches this, who likes it, who comments, I appreciate it. You don't have to pay me for me to appreciate you. It's just that I am really, really forced to seek support from strangers online to continue my show. Otherwise, it is 100% impossible for me. 100% impossible. 100% impossible to make videos like this one. There are several ways you can donate to my channel. I mentioned Patreon because this episode was a special reward to reward all the people who crowdfund me. But I also have things like PayPal in the description. I think I have an Etsy store where you can order like these cards with moss on them. I have a lot more, an Amazon store. And that is, I guess, the reason why I do have to add to all my videos an internet bagging segment. It's a little bit of an inside joke, the fact that I have to add it to each video. And I also want to say that all the funds that I raise online go to my independent research projects. I am somebody that studies, that researches butterflies and moths. I educate people about them. I have one of the biggest YouTube channels about butterflies and moths and also the study of insects. And all the funds that I raise online, I invest in this education. I own, own uh, several websites about insects, about their faunistics, their biological information, how to breed them in captivity and much more. I have even published life cycles that are new to science simply by breeding these insects in captivity. I think it's very important in a world where biodiversity is inclining, declining, to do stuff like this that explores our knowledge about insects. I think it will end up helping the environment. I think it will end up helping people appreciate insects. Most people are scared of insects. We don't like them. And we have to change the attitude. And that is what I really want to do. I want to help the paradigm shift of going from insects as weird, dirty creatures to something we should love, celebrate and appreciate. Which is what I am trying to do on YouTube. I am trying to promote conservation and show off the amazing biodiversity of all the insects on this planet, especially butterflies and moths, because they are my specialism. And for that, yes, for that, I need your help, ladies and gentlemen. I guess that's it. That's what I wanted to say today. Consider donating to my channel. Really, it helps me so freaking much as a small, 100% unsupported YouTuber who does all of this alone by himself. Sorry for the begging. I have no other choice. I hope to see you in the next episode of Moth Cycles. Hmm. What species shall we show next? Maybe the mulberry silk moth, Bombix mori? I do have a new interest in silk production. See you there. <clears throat> and now we will honor the names of my beautiful and generous patrons. They were the ones who, after all, make the show possible for me. This list of patrons was from February 2001, because this episode was edited, written, finished, scripted and uploaded in the month of February in the year 2021. I upload my videos later than I finish them, so the list may not be 100% up to date. That being said, maybe someday I hope to see your name on there too. Who knows?